Heather very much for that warm welcome. Well, it's great to be here, you know, and before I left Calgary, I had a dilemma to face because I had just finished writing a textbook for SAGE, but it was only at the first draft stage, and it was the textbook I wanted to use for the two classes I was going to be teaching here. So I decided, okay, let's go and get some copies put together. So I took it to a printer's, got 34 copies printed, put it in my suitcase, waited at home, and it was over 100 pounds. And I'm thinking, I don't want to pay extra just to get my suitcase to here. So I brought out a little carry-on suitcase. <clears throat> I stuffed that to the brim. And I put that on the weigh scale, and that alone weighed more than 50 pounds. Can you believe it? And my backpack, I stuffed it as well. And then my suitcase. And then it turned out at the airport, it never did weigh my primary <laughs> suitcase. You can imagine, you know, I bored it. I've got this tiny little carry-on pack with me that weighs a bloody ton. And, you know, I don't want anybody to know this because for some reason I feel a bit embarrassed. So like a ballet dancer, I try as gracefully as I can to pick that thing up. <laughs> the only way <laughs> really, it's going to fit in here, I know. And then thinking, what if it bloody well breaks this? <laughs> it drops on the guy, and it's just sitting there. So I was a little bit worried about that. But anyways, it turned out, I didn't have 34 students, so I have a few <laughs> So anyways, I have seven copies left, and uh, this does not include the references. I'll email that to you, but I have seven copies. I'm not lugging these back. <laughs> I'd like to give them away. And first, I would like to make them available to anybody who actually is in counseling practice. That would be, I think, the highest priority, because you can apply this stuff right away. It's good stuff. Uh, so who of you um, is in private practice right now, or practice of some kind as a counselor? Okay, there's a few of you, and just about seven. So would you take a copy at the end, and, uh, and if there's any copies left after that, anybody, please take them. I seriously will not take them back to Calgary. <laughs> so anyways, sometimes when I'm talking, I get excited. And sometimes when I get excited, I, I, I start to sound like a bitter queen. And, and I don't want you to forgive me, because that's not my intent, because I'm actually not bitter. <laughs> what I've learned is, if you start talking about your family, uh, you can do that. But if someone else starts talking about your family, <clears throat> you're walking on thin ice, right? And so my ex-wife, she's Filipina, still my very best friend to this day, and I learned very quickly, I could talk to her about anything, but I could never say anything bad about her family. Otherwise, I was going to be in the doghouse. And maybe for one day, maybe two, maybe three. But even if what I was saying was absolutely true, and she would say the same thing to me a month later, I could not say it. And now my husband, Manuel, from Mexico, same bloody thing. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I put myself in the doghouse because he's complaining about his family. And I, and I start to say, yeah, and what about this, and what about this? And then all of a sudden, <laughs> dead silence. He doesn't talk to me for a day. You know, it's funny how in relationships we tend to repeat relationship dynamics. And so now I've got a best in the form of a Manuel. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, it's really great to be here today. I have a lot of things to say. And I want to introduce you to one of my Canadian heroes. You probably don't know her from Adam, unless you've really spent a lot of time on the West Coast, then perhaps you would. But her name is Judy Williams, and she's the protector of a really special place. It's actually one of my favorite places in Canada. And does anybody know where this stair stairway goes to? It doesn't go to heaven. 
Where can I go? Down, down, down to ocean level. UBC campus. Is this ringing a bell for anybody? Wreck Beach. Hey, touche. You got it. Wreck Beach. And here's a camera ready shot of Wreck Beach. Yeah, it's kind of a clothing optional beach. You know? <laughs> Separately in a few moments. 
You know, Canada is an amazing country because we are, in so many regards, a world leader in human rights. And, you know, it's really proud to know that we are. And we've done a great deal for the world. And we also have a way of being an example that others can look up to, to see where a country can go when a country believes in giving people human rights. You know, uh, black slavery in the U.S., for example. You know, did we have black slavery in Canada? Well, we did. We did have a few, but we didn't have a direct route of bringing slaves over from Africa to Canada. No, a few of the well-offs in Canada went down to the U.S. to bring up their slaves. But slave trade never happened much here, not because of our character, but because it wasn't really that practical. The slaves were usually brought over to do work in the field. And our growing season is rather short. So most of the time, you would be just housing these slaves, feeding them, but not getting much work. So in terms of cost benefit, it was not practical in Canada to have many slaves here. So it never really caught on the same way. So we can feel good about that because of our weather. <laughs> well, they froze their asses off too, I hear, <laughs> as we do in our winter. Uh, also, you know, in terms of women's rights, you know, men were gracious enough in Canada to give women the right to vote in 1911. And uh, that didn't catch on for a few more months because the U.S. had to, of course, study us. Uh, and, and so they made it uh, so that you had to vote in 1912. Uh, so that was doing pretty good. And we never had a law forbidding people of different races to marry. So interracial marriage was always legal in Canada whereas there was a law that you could not in the U.S. up to a certain uh, time. So, so we've led the charge, haven't we? But in Canada, it's an interesting, very interesting country in a way because it's almost like a cosmic egg is sitting on a balance. And depending on the winds of change, whether those winds are blowing to the left or blowing to the right, that it can offset that cosmic egg and leave us all feeling a little bit more vulnerable. And so, politically, I mean, we don't know what our future holds right now. I was happy to see that, that here, you know, you mostly voted NDP because I think what that said is is you do support human rights. Um, but you know, the Conservatives got such a majority that now they're well set up to push through anything they want, to push through the real machine of their agenda, which us people in Calgary saw long before in its inception of what was once called the Reform Party, and then what then became the Alliance Party, and then what grew out from that the Conservative Party that somehow swallowed up that Conservative Party that was a bit progressive, the Progressive Conservative Party. What happened to those people? They were actually pretty decent folk. But anyways, who knows what the machine is going to look like. Gay history in the U.S., fascinating, fascinating. And what the heck did I put her up there for? Oh, she's kind of cute. <laughs> they all like the Wizard of Oz. Well, gay people love the Wizard of Oz. They love the rainbow and, and that you can, you know, become what you need to become and you can face adversity and you can develop courage and you can develop all these wonderful traits. And then our icon, Judy Garland, dies because of her own addiction issues, which many gay and lesbian and transgender people and transsexual people suffer with themselves gay people related to her, not just as the wonderful little Dorothy, but as the adult woman who struggled in this life and who succumbed to her own addictions. And that was a grievous day, for sure.
because it set the stage in the U.S. This was in New York City now, but we're moving to the weekend of June 27, 1969. Oh my God. What happened in New York City at the Stonewall Inn was something that was groundbreaking because you know it was normative both in Canada and the U.S. that police would raid gay bars. And they would raid them and they would take people out for whatever reason they could and they would verbally harass them. They would sometimes physically assault them. They booked them with asinine charges. It used to be illegal, for example, for a man to wear articles of clothing of the opposite sex. So a man in a dress, he were committing a crime already. And the truth of the matter was, there were a lot more drag queens back then. And why the heck was that? Not just drag queens. Drag queens are usually performers. But a lot more people were dressing up as women before they went out at night time because why? Because it was also illegal to be gay. It was considered a mental disorder before 1973 to be gay. And men had to disguise themselves because you cannot take the chance in that kind of culture to be caught dead walking into a gay bar. Right? Think about the consequences of that. You're going to lose your job. You know, in Alberta, you could have lost your job not so long ago for being openly gay. And then there was a test case, which we'll get into shortly. You could have been kicked out of your rental accommodation. Your landlord finds out you're gay. Doesn't like that. You're evicted that day without any notice, and you didn't have a leg to stand on. Your landlord was acting in accordance with the law. So, Drag queens started to fight back. They were pissed off. They were pissed off that their icon had died and something inside them started to burn with fury and that was we have a right to be who we are. Just like Judy Garland did. But look at the price she paid and we're not prepared to keep paying this price any longer. So it led to a rebellion, a fight that lasted that entire weekend. So police were getting beaten, uh, patrons were getting beaten, drag queens were having their uh, wigs pulled off, and just horrible stuff like that. <coughs> and you know, interesting changes were underway in Canada as well. And you know, the U.S. has always had a history of when a change is going to happen. There's usually some violence attached to it, right? The Civil War was a bloody war so that blacks could have some rights, I still wouldn't say equal rights in the U.S., or probably in most white-dominated cultures, but at least to get some rights. And so, now let's take a look at Canadian GLBT rights, stuff that we can really relate to, because the same year that the Stonewall Rebellion is going on, we have this very progressive man, right, here, Elliot Trudeau, who decriminalized homosexuality in Canada, so we didn't have to, you know, get beaten by police for that. He just simply made it law. 1982, the most important piece of legislation that ever came in in Canada to protect everybody's rights, every minority group, that all the challenges that go to the Supreme Court of Canada that have to do with human rights, ultimately that challenge is going to come back to our charter, thanks to, again, Pierre Elliott Trudeau and his government. But it wasn't until 1985, actually, that protection for gays and lesbians took effect, and for really other minority groups. Gays and lesbians were truly not mentioned in the uh, charter, so it was more through court challenges that it was uh, written in. Uh, Bill C-33, 1996, so sexual orientation becomes added to the Canadian Human Rights Act. That did not mean it was in the Human Rights Act of every province, but at least we had the national recognition of it. And this lovely cute boy, you know, uh, probably a lot of you saw the made-for-television movie about his struggle, you know, and he was on the news back then, because here this boy is going to school in Oshawa, Ontario. You know, Oshawa, you would think, is a pretty progressive place. 
because it's right next door to Toronto. You know, it's like about a 40 minute drive out of Toronto here in Oshawa. And this boy, you know, he's, he's a real sensitive guy. I mean, he'll cry at the drop of a hat, as I found out from one of my colleagues who had interviewed him about the entire fiasco. Every time the school made a decision, he cried and cried and cried. It affected him deeply, as it would anybody. How does a 17-year-old stand up to a system that has been universal, a Catholic system that says you don't have a right to do many things. Keep your big mouth shut, boy, because we don't even want to hear the word gay spoken in a Catholic school, let alone that you're actually, you have the audacity to think you're going to bring a boyfriend. Give me a break. And so the fight went on. And so, as you all know, he was able to bring his boy, his boyfriend, to the, um, you know, to his prom. Uh, imagine being so singled out like that, you know. I don't know if you've ever felt that, but you're going to have a chance to feel it here today. I'm going to give you that opportunity to feel singled out. Because I don't believe in just talking from the head. If I don't talk to you through the heart, then I haven't really got through to you. And my talks are not just about educating. My talks are also about affecting social change. Because what I've learned, you're going to hear about some of what I've learned as it applies to our students today, our GLBT students. By the way, the next kid is still a sitting duck in the Catholic school system, where they have Catholic school systems, for wanting to bring his same-sex partner to the next prom, because this never went to the Supreme Court. And uh, lawyers have wanted him to take it further. I'm afraid he got burnt out, for one thing. He was also in college. He he was not able to afford the cost of taking this to the Supreme Court level. And, and furthermore, he was no longer with that boyfriend. So imagine the stress that just this whole thing created in any relationship, uh, especially when you're 17. We don't generally expect relationships to last and last and last. But another very important piece of legislation, because before this, you can write the most scandalous letter about gay people or lesbians or any of the members of the GLBT community, have it published, and we might complain about it, but nothing could be done to you legally about it. You could even have gone to a gay kid's funeral, and there's been lots of those, by the way. You could have gone to his funeral with signs like they do in some parts of the U.S. and the signs say, God hates fags. Or, you know, your son, and they name your son, is going to hell. And some religious, crazy, right-wing people have done this kind of stuff in the U.S. And one of those crazy people wanted to come actually to Canada and come to our Calgary Pride one year to do the same thing. And luckily this legislation was already in place and he was stopped because he would have been arrested if he'd actually done that. It's now a criminal offense to um, write in this way that's uh, defamatory toward GLBT individuals. Really, really seminal day. I remember sitting in this local gay bar having a beer just mid-afternoon. The bar was half empty. And it was announced, and it was like, it was like, wow, it happened. And it was almost uh, like, uh, you know, where it just didn't have the effect you would have thought. It was just like, wow, it's happened. And yet it's changed history. Not just in Canada. We have changed history throughout the world. And tomorrow is, of course, the anniversary, the 60 year anniversary of same sex marriage. And how we change the world with this, the thinkers behind this were brilliant. Because good Canadians don't just want equality for us. We're actually not that selfish. We want to open up the pathways for equality for all. And so unlike the Netherlands, where they were the first to bring in same-sex marriage, 
One of you had to be a resident to get married there. And that would prevent people from elsewhere coming in, getting married, and then going up. Same thing in Massachusetts, and same thing in the other countries with the exception of Belgium. So we were one of those few countries. Anybody can come here. And you're thinking, what difference does that really make? You know, and I wondered the same thing at first. You know, but when I talked to these two guys from Hong Kong, then I got it. Because they had had a civil union in Vermont, where it was legal. Went back to Hong Kong to begin the challenge through the courts. The one fellow getting married was a lawyer. And uh, they were told, no, sorry, um, civil unions are not at par with marriage. They're two different things, so therefore, there's no precedent here. So the two were dismissed, and so was their marriage idea. But do you know, if you get married in Canada, if you get married anywhere, and I'm talking opposite sex marriage, and you can go anywhere else in the world and your marriage is still honored. You don't have to get married every time you move from Canada to Britain to Turkey to Bulgaria to wherever. You don't have to get remarried because of reciprocal marriage agreements that every country has in place to prevent that. So now are you starting to see where I'm going with this? Where? If you're married now, we're at par. And if you're at par, then you can begin a legal challenge. And it will be hard pressed for courts to deny you. And we're beginning to see the domino effect that Kathy and I have predicted. That same-sex marriage is here to stay, and we're beginning to see the domino effect of state after state, slowly, slowly moving in this direction. And I mean, even Washington, D.C. has same-sex marriage, and yet they do not have it federally. They still do not have it in the majority of states. And Barack has basically sat on the fence. He doesn't want to deal with it. You know, just like, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, for God's sake, you know, that California has, we think, would be the most liberal state of the U.S. And yet the fight down there has gone back and forth, back and forth, you know. Even uh, that one woman who had the talk show, O'Donnell, Rosie O'Donnell got married, and then it was like, Marriage is going to be absolved because it's no longer legal. So it's legal, it's not legal, it's legal, it's not legal. So then, what did Arnold Schwarzenegger do? Well, he said, it's going to get solved sooner or later anyways. So I do not need to intervene. And I just think this proves, once again, that steroids really do change <laughs>
from the get-go. How many of you want to put Henry in a little pink outfit? So, you might be a strong supporter of equality, but do you want everybody that sees your little Henry to be saying, Oh, what a beautiful daughter you have. She looks so pretty. She's so cute. Why don't you put barrettes in her hair? <laughs> do you want to face that? Do you want to face that kind of humility as a parent? Of course you don't. So you're going to put Henry in his rightful clothing. Henry's going to wear blue. If it's a daughter, then she can wear pink if she wants. Well, how do we know what she wants? She's a baby, but anyway. So Henry's a little boy who's going to come into the world in a very blue world. And so Henry's going to start to realize before too long that he's a boy. You know, and it doesn't matter whether eventually he has gender identity <coughs> disorder. He knows that he's a biological boy. That's what we call poor gender identity. You know, your gender identity may be something different down the road, but he knows he's a boy. But he also learns very quickly that dad is not happy if he is not playing with the right set of toys. And if dad wants to wrestle with Henry, as Henry's maybe even four or five years old, and Henry's not into it, that Henry learns that uh, dad isn't really liking this. He's not liking me. Because, you know, children are so deeply hypnotizable, right? They are like the best hypnotic subjects we have. Preschoolers, you know? Those in the pre-operational stage are the most hypnotizable. But two specialty areas. One is sexuality, GLBT specifically, and the other is hypnotherapy. I've practiced that for 28 years now. And, and so I see through the lens of how we all get hypnotized to believe certain things. And we come to believe them so much that they come to take on a life of their own and we actually believe it to be real. We cannot shake it no matter how hard we try. As so a little Henry is learning, Dad doesn't really like the way I am. Sometimes very vocal about it, but sometimes it's just in a way. He doesn't really um, hold me in his lap for very long. You know, it's, sometimes it's subtle. And the best hypnotic suggestion, by the way, is the subtle, the indirect. Because the indirect, we cannot resist. The direct, if I say you're going to quit smoking now, well, oh, that's pretty obvious, but who am I to tell you what to do? So the indirect suggestions are by far the most effective. Every hypnotherapist knows that. Okay, so little Henry finally gets to school already. His self-esteem is being slightly affected. And it's not too long until Henry also finds out he's not quite like the other boys. That the, other, the other boys uh, are much more into the rough and tumble play. You know, they, they like at recess time to, you know, wrestle sort of figuratively beat each other up. And they like to chase the girls instead of really play with them. And Henry likes to play with the girls. So he starts to learn that he's an odd duck, even in school. And he started to feel very alone in this because he knows that he's different and that he's not supposed to be. He's learned this from dad already and from maybe even mom. So we get him into junior high school. And Henry is also feeling that uh, his attractions are deviant. He best keep them to himself. Because boys are already calling each other fag and faggot. Uh, because, you know, every boy is going to call it faggot. It's not just the gays. It's one of my students and I uh, showed in a piece of research. The faggot is just a term that means you're not quite fitting uh, the hegemonic masculine role in this particular instance, whatever that instance is. So, you know, there's certain things you can do as a man to another man who won't be called a faggot. If you're, you know, playing football and the, your buddy scores a touchdown, you can give him a pat on the shoulder, you can pat his ass. Don't, don't feel the ass, but just pat the ass. You, know, you can do these things and nobody's going to blink an eye. But you start feeling that ass and, oh my God, that's another faggot. Faggot. And so faggot, everybody's a faggot. And how many people are being challenged when they use that word? So little Henry goes home looking for support. Now if he was a black child, he has black parents at home, 
If he was a little, you know, East Indian child, he has parents at home. If he's a little fat child, even if the parents aren't, they, they sympathize. You know, it, it happened that you're, you're fat, Henry. But no, Henry can't even go home and share this with his parents and get comfort and be consoled. Dad is still saying, I don't like what you're up to, Henry. I don't like the way you're developing. Something's wrong with you is the message that's perpetuated over and over and over again. And so finally, Henry gets to high school. He's not going on dates like the other boys, but the boys are talking about their dates, they're talking about sex, they're talking about girls. And these boys realize Henry doesn't fit into these conversations. He's an outsider looking in. So more and more, they begin to move away, consciously or unconsciously. Henry doesn't fit our, our peer group. So Henry's getting more and more isolated in his feelings, in his thoughts, in his behaviors. Is this helping to self esteem? And Henry finally gets to college, finally gets to university, finds himself in Acadia. What's it like? So, what is it like here?
under 5 to distribute the second one so that each of you will have two barometers. One is called your personal barometer and the other one is called Acadian barometer. So can I just have some people come forward to help me out?
You're all done? Okay. Uh, okay, does it need to, uh, how many of you believe it deserves about 90%? Okay, 80%? Between 80 and 90? Any score in there? Okay, not the majority. Okay, between 70 and 80%. Between 60 and 70 percent. Between 50 and 60 percent. Between 40 and 50 percent. It's the score, actually. You took the total score for the school. Did everybody understand that when I was asking this? Okay. Uh, between 30 and 40 percent. Okay, between 20 and 30 percent. God, you guys are really all over the map. And, and isn't that revealing in a sense? Because each of us has their own perception of these things. If we can't... Pardon? Oh, crap. <laughs> I'm talking to the wrong bunch. It's like asking me, how good is this place to be? Okay, nobody's beat me up yet. <laughs> so let's move on. What does the literature tell us then? Well, what is it like? The sexual is in minorities in Canadian schools. So pay attention to the years of publication because remember, all research is biased. And, and this obviously is coming around the year 2000 or so, right? So it's already 11 years outdated. Things are shifting, changing so fast, even I have trouble keeping up with it. Every time I look, another state has just legalized same-sex marriage, for example. But uh, back then, the dropout rate was 28% compared to 9% for the Canadian average for GLBT students. Now here's a piece of research I did. Three questionnaires mailed to 648 high school counseling centers in Alberta. What I wanted to find out was how homonegative they are, which means homophobic, just a more specific term, and how much their knowledge of homosexuality would be a factor in this. No a correlational study, of course. But what I found is higher levels of knowledge we're accompanied by more positive attitudes, and the reverse is true as well, that those who knew the least about us were the quickest to judge us. In Canada, graduate programs in counseling include little training in GLB, we could add the T, individuals. And yet we know counselors, for example, need to have affirming attitudes, adequate knowledge, and specific skills to be able to work with any minority group population. So how much training do they actually get? So this is a recent reference, 2009, published in the Canadian Journal of Education. So I sent a four-question email survey in 2004 to faculty in 14 Canadian universities, counseling faculty. I wanted to know how much training they provided. And so the modal response, means the most frequently reported response, was three hours of training at the master's level concerning GLB awareness, three hours concerning GLB counseling, zero hours at the doctoral level in GLB awareness, and zero hours of doctoral training in GLB counseling. And yet, you know, counselors, where we're expected to be in the know. And how can we be in the know if we haven't really learned much about this? I remember my own training, bachelor's degree in psychology. How many hours of training? Next to nil. It barely wasn't mentioned, and it usually was, you know, pathologized when it was. Master's training, master's in counsel, uh, clinical psychology. Zero training, PhD in counseling psychology, zero training. Now things are evolving, right? Things aren't the same as they were in 2004. 
But research has clearly established that homophobia and heterosexism are prevalent in Canadian schools. Again, not the years. How things changed a lot. Schools remain one of the last bastions where hatred toward GLBT people is tolerated. Year 2000. Homophobic remarks were frequently heard in schools. And this was Canadian research, so in Canadian schools. Some evidence suggests, well, it's not just some evidence suggests, Alberta government was the only government that sent a legal representative to Ottawa to fight same-sex marriage when it was at the level of the Supreme Court of Canada. <coughs> so, I think that's pretty strong evidence. One study reported that about 20% of gay and lesbian youth had been physically assaulted at school in the past year. 20%. Actually, that's a finding that's quite uh, universal. About 20% of gay men have been physically assaulted in their lives. Who is this young guy? Well, Asmi Jubran. He was a student back in the 90s. Okay, things have changed a lot since the 90s. But uh, he was teased, called all kinds of homophobic insults. And he decided to take the British Columbia school that he was attending to court. He was awarded 4,500 in damages, sending a strong message that if schools do not act, the judges will. The interesting thing is he wasn't even gay himself, right? As many people that are throwing these insults, they're not gay, they're just whatever. They're just maybe a bit different. Another quote. Okay, so feelings. Look at the year now. And we're talking Quebec. Quebec is a wonderful place. Who does not enjoy going to Montreal? It's a beautiful city. It looks so progressive. You go down St. Catharines East. We see gay people everywhere. And they're kissing and they're holding hands. And nobody bats an eye. And yet, why is it that they're reporting that the LGBTIQ students are feeling excluded. Since 1995, Toronto was really right on the ball and they opened up a school that was specifically for, you know, uh, LGBTI, I hate that acronym, but you know, it's just too long. I have a hard time saying it. So they opened up their own school. But really, why is it necessary to have your own school? If I'm a gay kid, why can I not go to your school and feel comfortable and feel safe and feel supported? If I have to go to a special school, is that a good thing? Or is that a reflection of our society? So here's some painful reflections that Cheryl Erlinson collected with the Saskatchewan Teachers Federation. This was 2004. One student said, overall, my experiences at school was a big experience of silence. Another, heard people using terms in a derogatory way. You know, what a fag, you're a fag, everything's a fag, that's gay, that's so gay. One of my friends in the clique I hung around with wore a shirt that said, AIDS kills fags dead. So these comments were never challenged back then, according to one student. Teachers would sometimes say it will be quiet, but it wasn't always, and it definitely wasn't challenged or explored further. I have a hard time not holding things against the teachers, but they didn't address these issues in school. They were the adults. They were shaping us. So some other findings. Um, they experienced greater needs. Of emotional isolation, psychological stress, substance abuse, verbal abuse, running away from home, school absences. They're likely to have fewer same-sex friends. They're likely to suffer reduced self-esteem, reduced feelings of school safety. If our children really are our future, then 
The way we're treating them is it helping them to become more loving individuals. And you may or may not agree with what I'm about to say, but I do believe something in the Bible that we can only love other people in so much as we love ourselves. As my ability to love is diminished, then it means I cannot bring the very best into my society, and I can certainly not bring the very best into my relationships. And I have certainly seen lots of gay men and lesbian women find it hard to get beyond a certain point in their relationships because as they cross that line, they really do become gay or lesbian. It's like when you fall in love, it's like, oh my God, now I'm, my life is complicated because how am I going to hide you, the one I've fallen in love with? How am I going to hide you everywhere I go? You know, and I love you on top of it, but it's like, you're kind of like a sore on my rear end. <laughs> So, in other words, if we take away from people's ability to love, we're doing this world a great, great disservice. JLBT adolescents engage more frequently in high-risk sexual behaviors. We have found this to be true of, of the spread of AIDS. And by the way, AIDS is increasing worldwide. Worldwide. All the research points to this. And it's happening especially in the younger population for many reasons, one of which is they don't think that the disease is fatal anymore. And also even the porn movies are showing now condomless sex for the first time that we haven't seen since the 80s before we really knew much about the HIV virus. And so even the visual that we're getting, the suggestions, visual suggestions are it's okay to bear back your partner because nobody's going to get hurt by it. People who don't love themselves very much don't take good care of themselves. GLBT youth in British Columbia are seven times more likely to attempt suicide than non-gay youth. Published 2008. Here's our best study we have in Canada. In the U.S., they've been doing a national study every two or three years. GLSEN is the acronym. You can look them up. They're finding consistently that homophobia and heter heterosexism remains highly prevalent throughout every state in the U.S. And now finally we have a piece of research in Canada uh, done by EGAL. They've only surveyed 1,700, but it's still the biggest study done to date in Canada. And look at this. Three quarters of the students felt unsafe in at least one place at school. Over a quarter had skipped school at least once because they felt unsafe. Over three quarters heard homophobic remarks every day, not just some days, every day. About half agreed or somewhat agreed with the statement, it's hard for me to feel accepted here at my school. Six out of ten said they had been verbally harassed. One in four had been physically harassed in one way or another, both from being shoved into lockers to being kicked down. Violence, the best book we have on this is by Jan Off, a Canadian, who reported between 1990 and 2004 roughly 107 queer bashing homicides in Canada and 344 bashing incidents reported to police, but of course that's likely underestimated. Other research that says the violence inflicted on GLBT individuals is much more violent than it is toward those who are not members of the community. Who is this young woman? Well, she's a woman in Edmonton, April 2010. She was just walking around, walking along, and she got beat up by a bunch of kids throwing uh, homophobic remarks at her while she was beat up. These kind of stories are endless, by the way. You can pull them up on the internet. And uh, the police chief apologized. Well, what did he have to apologize for? It wasn't his fault. Well, because it took them 30 minutes to arrive on the scene. 30 minutes for the police to arrive when you're being assaulted. Is that not disgusting? And there's no reason for that, other than they dismissed it 
is not important. Who is this young woman? Well, April 28, 2010, she was dismissed from her job because she is a lesbian parent. And she was a teacher. Extreme violence is thankfully rare. The last incident where um, a killing happened was in Tabor, Alberta, 1999. 14 year old kills a schoolmate because he's been continually harassed, being called faggot gay. And again, this boy is not even gay. It's kind of like if we don't stand up for all of us, we all become targets eventually. So while fear calls on every teacher to work for social change, few will actually listen to the call and do something. We don't have time for this particular piece, but this was a news piece uh, from Newfoundland that I had uh, taped when I was there last summer. And uh, what they're talking about is how students in Newfoundland still do not feel safe in their schools. Will you be one of the ones who helps us to survive and to thrive? So what you can do. Let's get down to the practical. I want to offer you a few suggestions now. Write this down. I will send you this PowerPoint, by the way, if you email me, okay? If you don't uh, want to write it down, because I am going to have to go through this fast. I know this time is escaping. Uh, so have a no-tolerance policy. Get rid of, that's so gay. That's not so gay, because everybody knows if you say that's so gay, that that's not a good thing. So instead, be accurate. This is different, this is weird, this is atypical, whatever. You know, Faggots were the sticks that were used to burn witches. That's where the word came from. And back then, then they started to replace those sticks with people they identified as gay, whether they were or not. And they put them around and burned them. And they became the faggots instead of the sticks. So do not allow this word. You probably don't allow people to go around calling black people by the N-word. I can't even say that word. I find it so insulting. But we find it insulting when you call us faggots. Create a gay-straight alliance or a club. You probably have that at this school. Have visible signs in your classroom of accepting diversity. Have a small rainbow flag and flags from other countries. Because it's not just about us. It's about celebrating diversity, and that means ethnic diversity as well. Use inclusive language. Are you dating someone instead of, do you have a girlfriend? Invite a panel of GLT, BT people to speak to your class. Get to know them. Get to become friends with them. It will normalize you. You'll see, we're just like the rest of you. And a quote from Eric Erickson, that someday, maybe, there will exist a well-informed, well-considered, and yet fervent public conviction that the most deadly of all possible sins is the mutilation of a child's spirit. And so now we take the walk back up from Red Beach, where my need to be grounded now I need to just be amongst all of you and be one of you. But you know that cosmic egg that sits on the balance, that if you poke a little hole in that egg and you allow some of the white to flow out of it, you're going to be left with a yolk. And like a bobo dog, when the winds of change blow, try to swing it to the left or swing it to the right. It will come back into the center again to maintain its equilibrium, its balance. And I want to thank you for popping that little hole in your cosmic egg. 